Well, I'm very, very happy to be here. I have to thank Stephen Waller for the invitation and uh, Jean-Pierre Uri of IFRA. And uh, it gives me an opportunity to uh, try and put a certain message across. And I've uh, tried to remember actually what it is that that message is. So um, what I'm going to try and talk about today are the secondary benefits of ODA and how we can exploit them. And um, I think this is the future for uh, fragrance and the perfume industry. It is happening now. I mean, people are looking at the secondary benefits of perfume ingredients, um, but it's maybe not happening in the mainstream perfume industry. There seems to be a certain reluctance to depart from the uh, commercial model that has worked for so many years in selling perfume. Um, and I think that the other point is that we can't ignore any longer what the ingredients, the perfume ingredients, are actually doing on a physiological and a pharmacological level. I'm going to try and explain some of the quite exciting uh, research that's been done and some of it's what we're doing in my lab. And um, in Cardiff, part of the university there. And I have a website which, if you are interested in following up anything that we're doing, um, you just type smell into Google. And it used to come up first, but uh, I have a battle with Wikipedia, and uh, sometimes Wikipedia comes up first. OK. <coughs> so it's uh, back to school. University students are already returning. Uh, so I'm sort of gearing up to start my lectures again. Um, I'm going to try not to lecture you today. Most of you will know all about the olfactory system. I just want to make one or two quick points. That is, it smells, obviously, as we all know, are mixtures and very often very complex mixtures. And they, the components activate the olfactory receptors. And each component will activate many receptors. And the effect, the perception, uh, is quite a complex process, how we achieve perception. Um, I think because I only have half an hour, I'm going to skip the basics. You all know where the olfactory um, epithelium and the, the olfactory bar are, so I'm going to skip that. And the major functional unit of the olfactory system is the glomerulus and this. <laughs> So these are the glomeruli here, just a few, but there are 2,000 <coughs> per olfactory bulb. So the input comes from receptor cells, and it comes into these glomeruli here. They are the, uh, they're made up of these axons from the olfactory receptor neurons and the apical dendrites of the mitral cells. These are the projection neurons of the olfactory bulb. These go to the brain. And it's probably proper to consider the olfactory bulb as part of the brain, in the same way that the retina is part of the brain. Um, it's a part of the brain that's sort of sprouted outwards. And the same is true of the olfactory bulb. And there is a degree of processing that is taking place in the olfactory bulb. So, Remember the glomeruli, these are the functional units of the system. And here is an olfactory bulb, and here are a few more glomeruli represented. And what happens is that odor A and odor, a single ingredient, will activate a number of different glomeruli. The glomeruli, um, each glomerulus receives input from the olfactory receptor neurons expressing one type of olfactory receptor. That's very key to how the system works. And so each of these glomeruli is a feature detector, it's a molecular feature detector. So it might be, you know, there is a molecule, a smell molecule, it has a sticking out bit. There will be a, a receptor that recognizes that sticking out bit. There'll be another receptor that will recognize the length of the molecule, another receptor that might recognize the side groups. 
So these are feature detectors, and the pattern of activation gives you um, an idea of what the molecule is. It's a bit like having blindfolding a number of people and telling them to feel an elephant, one person feeding the trunk, another person feeding the leg, tusks, tail, and this information about the separate components of the elephant is then relayed to a sort of central processing um, station, the brain, which then says, ah, that is an elephant. The system has to make some quite fine um, judgments. It has to analyze what the input is. And as we mentioned, most odors are mixtures. So if you have a simple mixture, two odors, it might well be that they activate a completely different set of receptors. So that is a very simple problem to the brain. Odor A is easily distinguished from odor B, activating different receptors. But of course, that almost never is the case. It's more likely that there is a degree of overlap. So here we have odor A and odor B. They activate some independent, some unique um, glomeruli and receptors, but there is overlap. So odor A and odor B activate these, both activate these ones that are represented in purple. So the brain will see this mixture completely differently to that mixture. It may integrate this into an odor object. Here, it has great difficulty in distinguishing odor A and odor B. It will, there will be now, uh, there's a sufficient ambiguity in the activation for that to not be recognized as individual odor ingredients. Um, so this is just uh, the only point I want really to make here is that the processing that goes on in the olfactory bulb is quite complex. It can do, an, can do amazing things. But eventually what it does is to relay an odor percept to the olfactory centers of the brain. And that percept is the conscious awareness and perception of the odor or the perfume. We can trick the system because of the mechanics and the anatomy that I've just shown you. And one classical um, illusion, as you are all probably aware, is that of the a mixture of guaiacol and benzaldehyde um, together, these two compounds have, can form an illusion of vanillin. Because if you look at the side groups in vanillin, they are contained uh, separately in benzaldehyde. There's the uh, aldehyde group and guaiacol. So if you combine guaiacol and benzaldehyde in the right proportion, the smell is no longer phenolic or bitter almonds. It actually is a smell of vanilla. So that gives, you, so gives us some insight into how the system is, is working. So that's the primary response to odor. Our olfactory system is doing a very complex job in analyzing what's coming in. But uh, what I want to concentrate on today are the secondary uh, effects. And aromatherapy has been using fragrance uh, for secondary benefits for millennia, although it hasn't been, hasn't been called aromatherapy for that length of time. And I guess what um, my lab is about is looking at the science behind these secondary effects. But of course, um, do we have any aromatherapists in the audience? I don't think so. You're mostly from perfume companies. So I'm not going to offend too many people. Um, I, as you get older, you, your sort of inhibitory mechanisms um, stop working so well. And I have already yesterday offended um, a perfumer by making rude remarks about what uh, perfumers know about olfaction. Um, so I'm now probably going to offend anybody who has an interest in aromatherapy. 
Um, so let's go to the font of all knowledge at Wikipedia. And we learn that aromatherapy is the treatment or prevention of disease by the use of essential oils. Two basic mechanisms are offered to explain the purported effects. One is the influence of the aroma on the brain, especially the limbic system through the olfactory system. The other is the direct pharmacological effects of the essential oils. And, and that is key, pharmacological effects of the essential oils. We'll come back to that. While the precise knowledge of the synergy between the body and the aromatic oils is often claimed by aromatherapists, the efficacy of aromatherapy remains unproven. However, some preliminary clinical studies of aromatherapy in combination with other techniques show positive effects. In the English-speaking world, practitioners tend to emphasize the use of oils in massage. Aromatherapy tends to be regarded as a complementary modality at best and a pseudoscientific fraud at worst. Well, I, I, I guess I'm trying to study the secondary effects of odor. So uh, I am in the field of aromatherapy, like it or not, and um, most of my scientific colleagues, certainly those in physiology, uh, really do turn their nose up, literally, at the mention of the word aromatherapy. Clearly, there are two possible routes for aroma chemicals to work. The first is the odor, and that is via the olfactory system that we've just been looking at. And of course, the second is the intrinsic pharmacological properties of the chemical ingredients. So the first, the, the olfactory system, um, implies association and memory for odors to have um, effects, or if we don't uh, Look at, if we don't invoke that, we have to invoke magic. Uh, and the second is uh, pure pharmacology, and the two effects are probably synergistic. So how do odors achieve these second, secondary effects? Um, aromatherapy involves massage mostly, so that's the, the essential oils in the, or the ingredients of the essential oils can enter the bloodstream through skin absorption. But what about the fragrance? What about the fragrance? I mean, aromatherapy does not actually, the term, the word, doesn't imply uh, massage, although we, we know that that is how most aromatherapists work. But the, the, the idea of aromatherapy is that the aroma itself can have an effect. Well, let's look at this. I'm going to choose two examples today which will be um, probably uh, familiar to all of you. Linalool and vanillin, and we'll start with Linalool, oh, no, we won't, we'll start with vanillin. And it, it, vanillin acts at uh, vanilloid recept receptors, and these were known uh, as vanilloid receptors for many years, but just recently they have been cloned and identified as TRPV receptors, transient receptor potential receptor channels. These are non selective cation channels that are activated by compounds which can be loosely described as vanilloids. Um, they are membrane proteins, and when they are activated, they in turn activate a nerve, and which nerve they activate depends on where these uh, receptors are situated. The vanilloid receptors are activated by compounds that have a vanillyl group. Right. The vanilla group is this structure here, and here we have some common vanilla compounds that you will all be familiar with. Here is vanillin, eugenol, zingerone, and capsaicin. I think it's quite surprising that capsaicin and vanillin uh, can be considered within the same group of chemicals. They are binding, they have an uh, a group here which is, has the same um, chemistry and therefore they will be active at overlapping groups of receptors which we'll look at now. I'm going to focus, there are six members of the vanilloid receptor family, but I'm going to focus just on TRPV1 and TRPV3 because they are the ones at which uh, vanillin <coughs> has been shown to bind 